Good. Can you guys see my screen? First, first of all, let me tell you guys how sad I am that I'm not physically in the classroom, especially after I saw the classroom. I thought that most of you guys would be in, uh, on a Zoom link, but as long as you guys are physically there, so I'm sorry I'm, I'm not here. Unfortunately, I'm traveling internationally for my work and it wasn't easy for me to come back to the US in time. So um, I wish I was here physically, that would make a big difference because I really enjoy the interaction and seeing you guys. My name is Khaled El Magoub. Um, uh, and it's a, a tough name, but it has a meaning. Both my first name and my last name have a meaning in my language. So whenever you feel that the lecture is bore, boring or something is happening and you are sleeping, at least fortunately enough, I can see you guys, it's not Zoom. So this is, makes a little bit more tough for you guys to sleep. But if you are feeling that there is, uh, it's not going in the right direction, just ask any question. And one of the questions that always my students used to ask me, what does Khaled mean, okay? And I will tell you what, what it means. This tells me that I'm going in the right direction and I really need to make the, the, the lecture more interactive. Usually I like these talks to be interactive as much as we can. I know there is a time limit, but I will try to make it interactive as much as I can. So please, please ask any questions. Whenever you feel that the flow is not right, there's some logical things that you do not understand. And I always say there is nothing called stupid questions. A question is a question. Someone is trying to ask to really understand what's going on. So please make sure to ask whenever you have a doubt and don't worry, I will try my best to answer if I know the answer. If not, then both of us can look for someone to help us out. As I mentioned, my name is Khaled El Magoub. I'm currently the head of software quality at Philips globally. For whom you, or for you who does not know Philips, Philips is a company that used to be like the General Electric of Europe. It used to have tons of divisions, Philips Electronics, Philips Appliances, Philips Lightning, tons of things. They spin off everything and they only now focusing on Philips medical devices. So I'm currently focusing on medical devices. And by medical devices, we are talking about devices that goes from toothbrush, which is personal care, up to devices that go, it's a very wide spectrum, up to devices that goes like CT scan, MRI machines, even devices that has catheters and robotic arms that would do surgical um, things for you. They call it image guided therapy, which is the therapy with uh, less invasive things with, with robotics that can go inside the human's body. And I'm responsible for the software quality for all uh, the products there, all these businesses and, uh, and, and products. At the same time, currently I'm a part-time lecturer at Tufts. So I teach uh, at Tufts University, electrical engineering, electrical and computer engineering and computer science department. Today's talk, first of all, let me say hi, ni hao, marhaba, uh, konnichiwa, um, uh, ola, wherever you are, wherever you're from. And um, today's lecture is about introduction to software reliability. I don't know how many of you guys heard the term software reliability before. I will ask. I will make sure to make it, as I mentioned, as interactive as possible. The presentation is going to be divided into first an introduction. It will look trivial. I will ask very trivial questions. A lot of you guys would say, oh, what is this crazy guy asking us about? But it's very important. And believe it or not, even in industry, it's not only in academia. It's very important for all of us to start from one ground. We have a common ground to start from. Because a lot of the definitions when it comes to quality, reliability, even software itself, a lot of the definitions are not always used in the right place and it's not, sometimes it's interchangeable. And at least it's very important for us to have an agreement on these definitions. What is software? What is software reliability? What does software reliability means? And so on and so forth. I just want to put a basic, as I mentioned, common ground so we could all start building upon from there. The next section would be about software reliability engineering some of the activities that we'll be doing in software reliability and why um, 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 uh, these activities are important. We'll end up with a summary. And I was asked by uh, Professor Langdon to, <laughs> to make a quiz, <laughs> like some kind of a take-home quiz or a take-home assignment. Um, it's not my idea, just to give you guys a heads up. But anyway, it will be, there will be some take-home assignment for you guys, as, as the professor mentioned, for you to do it. I don't know next week, whatever is the timelines you guys are on. Uh, I'm sorry about that, but it is what it is. So and it, it's also make sure that you guys got some of the information that we are describing in this lecture. Before we start, any questions? The, 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 the voice is clear. You guys can see me, can see my presentation. We have all the logistics set up in the right place. Good, good. I can see some people doing their heads like this. This tells me that, that we are going in the right direction. First question for all of you. What is software? And I'm lucky that you guys are in a, in a, in a classroom so I, I could easily 
hear what you guys are saying. Anybody, what, what is software? You guys are studying computer science or computer engineering or electric engineering, whatever you are studying, and your little brother or sister or someone in the street who is like maybe second grader or fourth grader, and you would tell him, oh, I'm going to be a software engineer or I'm going to be working in software. A simple human question would be, oh, what does software mean? What is software? What are you going to answer him or her? Anyone? Including Professor London also. <laughs> so anyone, anyone is allowed to answer. Go ahead, guys. Anyone have any idea what is software? What is the first thing that comes to your mind when I talk about a software? And remember, participation rate matters. Say that, say it again, London. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. I said that participation grade matters. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then again, for guys, forget about grades. It's always about the, the learning. Grades is something with, is a byproduct, would come later, believe it or not. But just focus on the learning. So again, I'm asking you a simple question. Assume that someone is asking you, you are working in software, what does this mean? And believe it or not, it's not a trivial also definition. Anyone, come on, guys. We have an answer. Uh, I think some application, some program. OK, so what I heard, unfortunately, it was a little bit far away, but I can tell, again, I will repeat it again, especially that this is recorded. It's some kind of an application that you could use. Is this right? Yes. That, that's, that's, that's right. But what application consists of? Can you tell me the components of a software? It's, it's like a collection of, collection of code that um, creates a platform. Good. So I, I, I heard. I'm sorry for interruption, but I heard that, uh, again, I'm, I'm always trying to repeat to make sure that I got it right. So you're talking about it's some piece of codes, collection of code that would build a platform. Is this right? Yeah. Okay. That's, 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 so uh, honestly, that's, that's a, one of the first answers that always come to my mind when I, when I think about software, which is a piece of code. That's totally right. It is, it is part of the software is a piece of code. Is it only a piece of code or some other components? Come on, guys. What else besides code? Is it an application? Is, is it just a piece of code or, or it's just code or there's other components into it? You also need visuals and graphics. Like, you need visuals, images, videos, et cetera, along with it. If I heard it right, you are talking about any libraries, any external dependencies, is this right? Did I get it right? So he, he was specifically talking about the UX elements. Uh, and I'll try to transcribe questions for you uh, to Zoom. Uh, if that's yep. helpful. Uh, so, but I, I would agree it's libraries as well. So just, just to give you guys a heads up, let's, let's move forward because I'm, I'm, I'm trying just to make sure that we are all on the same page. By the way, this is not my definition. This is the definition from IEEE. And why I'm saying this, for you guys, when you go and work in industries that I, uh, I'm sorry? Uh, you, for you guys, when you go work in industries like the one that I'm working in right now, which is highly regulated industry, which means that there's a lot of organizations and a lot of regulatory bodies that are always auditing you and making sure that your software and your products are of a certain quality and certain and certain level, it's always important to understand the definitions. Why? Because part of the components that is included in software according to either IEEE definitions or even FDA definitions is that it's not a computer programs only. It is computer programs, it's code, but also the procedures such as any documentation that you do like testing, like things that you do um, uh, while you are developing your software, also possible associated documentation, such as licensing, uh, user uh, manuals, um, 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 uh, instructions for use, whatever are all these things included, and also any data or, that is important for the operation of this computer code, such as libraries, external code, external dependencies, all, all those things. And all this whole package together is what is the definition in at least in industries like automotive or medical devices, or even according to IEEE, this is the definition of software. So moving forward, when I'm talking about software here in this presentation, I mean all the components included in it, not just the piece of code, okay? Because a lot of people who just focus on the code, which is totally maybe the biggest bulk of, of what a software is all about, but it's also other things that is included with. And I always put it in a simple way. I don't like scientific explanations. I just put it there for you guys to at least have a common understanding before we start. 
but I always put it in this. A code would be translated into a software when it's tested, when it's have the appropriate documentation, when someone else beside the people who develop it can really understand it and maintain it and work with it. It doesn't have to be the, the person or the people or the team that or originally developed this code. So once the code have all these phases and all these components around it, now it's a piece of software. The easiest example of this is that if you have a simple source code and you have those Windows packages or maybe tools packages, you would see a lot of DLLs, a lot of licensing, a lot of uh, maybe auto run applications with it. There is tons of other things that comes with this package and all of this package as a, as a whole is what is called as a software. So our first takeaway, I, I don't know if you guys agree on or not on this, but, but it's important to know that software is, yes, it's a piece of code, it has code, that's a bulk of what's happening, but it has other things included with it, documentation, procedures, and data that is necessary for this code to be operated by someone else beside that who developed it. Do you guys agree on this definition or anyone have any questions before we move forward? And believe it or not, this is important in the coming steps. So it's very important. I know it might be look trivial for you guys, you already study it, but it's important for you or for us to at least agree upon this definition before moving forward. Any questions? You guys can raise your hands and, and Professor Landon can tell me um, uh, the question and because he's closer to the mic, so, and we can go from there. I'm also trying to transfer, so, uh, yep. okay. Yeah, we're good. Good, good. So what does software do? In the old days, software wasn't as involved in our daily life as it is nowadays. You guys all agree that nowadays, by the way, a couple of those industries I really worked in. So autonomous driving, I was working in autonomous uh, automo automotive industry and I was developing autonomous driving before going to medical devices. But in both cases in here and here, as you can see nowadays, more and more software is really involved in all aspects of our lives. You would trust a software to drive your car, really. You would trust a software to calculate the radiation dosage that is going to be used to help you or treat you. You would trust the software in the autopilot um, 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 uh, system of, uh, of an aeroplane to really fly the aeroplane for very, very long distances. So we are talking about here, death or life matters kind of, of, of things that software is included in them, either in automotive industry, either in aerospace industry or aviation, either in medical devices. And as you can see, I'm putting the very highly regulated industries that you would see in your in your day-to-day -day life and how important this software here because now we are really talking about the death or life matter things, okay? So let me ask you a question, not, not about reliability. We'll ask about what software reliability, but forget about software reliability. When I ask you to define a reliable friend or to identify a reliable friend, a human being, what is the characteristics that you would use? Or what is the definition of a reliable human being for you? Anyone? What What was this, Landon? I'm sorry, I didn't get it. Someone you can trust. Good. Someone you could trust. That's a very good point. So someone you could trust, you could depend upon. If you need him or her, you would always find them. Is this right? This is exactly the same impression or the same thing you should take in the software reliability. So let me tell you, according to the, the, the dictionary definition, it's quality of being trustworthy, the trust, or performing consistently. You are performing, you are always giving the same performance. And we say a reliable experiment from dictionary, Miriam Miriam Webster, I think I got this from, or Google or whatever, if you just look for any dictionary, a reliable experiment is the experiment that every time you repeat it, it will give you the same results. It is something that you could depend upon. It consistently perform according to your understanding, according to your definition. So always, I always say Khaled is a reliable friend. Why? Because every time I call him, he will pick the phone. If I'm in trouble, he would always come and, 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 and do it for me. He's always on time. That's reliable. Means that he's consistently showing on time. Consistently, I can depend that he, is, is, he or she would be depending on time. Exactly the same when you go to software. But for software, usually they like to put some scientific definitions there to make it more appealing. So the, 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 the definition is the probability of failure-free software operation for a specified period of time in specified environment. 
And I always like when I, by the way, this definition, as I've told you, it's, it's not easy, it's not trivial to define reliability. I will tell you guys why. Um, um, but, but I always try as much as I can when I define this even to my uh, engineers in my team, I always say focus on three components here. There are big three components that I'm putting in bold in this definition that are important. First of all, failure free. There is no failure. This thing works according to expectation. The second part is time. You really need to have specified time that have to be some kind of a time in it, which means that this thing would work for a certain amount of time without failures. The third and the most one of the most important things that people always ignore is environment. By environment, I mean the specified condition that this product should work in. The easiest example that I always use, get a track bike, a bike that is designed to go for indoor track for high speed and try to use it in mountain bike instead of a mountain bike kind of environment. It will break much faster. And then you would say, oh, this product is not reliable. I'm sorry, you used it in a non-specified environment, in an environment that this product wasn't supposed to be used in. So those three are very important. And here why I'm telling you that reliability is not a trivial thing. First of all, and believe it or not, I always see it in real life. Customer would never use your products in the specified environment, period. Some of them will. Some of them would always use it in a different way that you shouldn't, that you never expected. So for example, I will tell you guys a very easy example. You guys, and again, I'm talking about hardware now, not software, but you can use the analogy there. You know, the, the, the electrical toothbrush, it has those heads that you really need to change in a certain amount of time. When you buy them, if it's written even in a very small font, it will tell you to change them maybe every three months, four months, whatever it is. Say it again. I say just background noise. Oh, okay. So um, it will always ask you to, to, to change these things in a certain amount of time. Uh, I'm one of the customers who never even read about these timelines. And I always use my judgment when I see the colors are fading away from the, the toothbrush heads and they start to, and they at the end, they will not be as reliable as they used to be in the beginning, but this is not a failure of the product. Why? Because you used it in an unspecified environment with a, more time than it was supposed to be done. But moving forward to agree upon a definition just to make our life easier. And I will tell you why it's not trivial because it's not trivial because reliability is have some, most of the quality aspects have some personal perspective on them. So whoever answered, he is a person that I could trust. The definition of trust even for you could be different than the definition of trust for me. So for example, the definition of trust for me could be that I tell him or her a secret and they never give it out. For you, this is not as important. It's important to always show when I need them. So even this definition is, is, is somehow personalized. That's why even the definition of reliability is somehow personalized. It's not trivial and it's very important for us to really agree, agree upon something. So one of the agreeable upon definitions is failure-free operation for a certain amount of time with specified environment. Any questions before we go? And, and, and look at a bigger umbrella than reliability, which is quality. Quality is a bigger umbrella than reliability. Unfortunately, as I told you, quality is not even um, um, uh, agree upon definition. I will tell you guys a very strange story and it's a personal story. I'm originally from Egypt. Egypt is a, is a warm country, hot weather a little bit hot. And I used to, uh, the quality weather for me, if you ask me, I would say it's the warm, hot weather. Now I lived in Boston for almost 14 years. If you ask me, I would say, ah, I would prefer to be in a cold weather nowadays more. So even a, the same person, quality weather definition, it changed based on my uh, environment and a lot of things. So that's why quality is not an easy also thing to, to, to it's not a trivial thing to define. But in general, I like to use this framework. <laughs> this framework is called the ISO framework. And I always call it the LT frameworks, which you can see everything at the end, end with the LT. Uh, we are now focusing, or today we're only focusing, later we could focus on all these things, but today we're only focusing about reliability. And part of the reliability is the availability, the fault tolerance, the maturity, recoverability, how fast you can recover. And we will talk about all these things moving forward. So moving forward, what I want you guys to, 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 to put in mind, the second takeaway is software reliability means the probability of failure-free software operation for a specified period of time for a specified environment. So moving forward, you really need to understand that uh, this is what the reliability definition means in this presentation, okay? So now we have two takeaways, what is software and what is software reliability? I hope this is, this is clear. Any questions before we move forward? Let me put the second slide. Any questions? 
If not, then I will move forward. I hope this is clear enough. So as I mentioned, it's not as easy or it's not trivial to define what is a reliable product because of the personal aspects in it, but it's very easy to define or to recognize an unreliable product. This is very easy to see, very easy to recognize. So if your car broke, that's one moment of unreliability. This blue screen was taking maybe days of our life in the old days. I don't know Windows now is, is a little bit better than it used to be, but in the old days, this is we had those blue screens, especially when your system is, is overwhelmed or something, you would see these blue screens um, frequently. So this is, this is how this is very easy to define an unreliable software. And in the old days, all these things might be inconvenient. Yes, it could be huge inconvenience. Like, as I mentioned, your, your, your laptop had this blue thing. You could wait for a little bit, maybe an hour or half an hour until it restarts and then recover your data. It was a huge inconvenience, but still, it's not a life or death matter. Unfortunately, nowadays, any failures on those software, it's a life or death matter. By the way, I'm putting here real life example. And I didn't care about money at all. Those are real life example where life was lost. This is the disastrous thing that could ever happen. One life of a human being is a, is a disaster. So if you are working in industries that you know that your product could at the end end up to kill someone, you really need to be very, very, very like cautious about what you are doing. So for example, I, I know it wasn't the autopilot issue of Tesla. That wasn't the, the, the reason for the accident. And what was Tesla claiming about? That it was something else and the autopilot was fine. But still moving forward with autonomous driving being in your life, any unreliable issues in the software, it will, it might lead to a, a life or death matter, honestly. And while I was working in automotive, we always made sure that you could always retrieve to a safe state as much as you can. We do testing, tons of testing, millions of miles, simulations, as much as we can, because we know how crucial is the software here or software part here. You guys all heard about the, the issue of the Boeing MAX um, uh, 773, I think the number was which is the maneuvering characteristics augmentation system. What happens is there was some software malfunction that would, um, uh, the sensor would think that the, 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 this is the, where is the aeroplane is, but actually the aeroplane was in this thing. So what will happen is the sensor would try to compensate for this error uh, sensor data, and it will knock the nose down until the aeroplane crash and two aeroplane crashes and many life was lost in this kind of situation. Uh, another one, I don't know if you guys are uh, heard about it before or not, but if you ever open the, the most expensive uh, 10 bugs, uh, usually Panama City Cancer, Cancer Institute is one of them. And Panama City, what happens is that this device, they had two modes, mode in a test mode and mode in operation mode. They didn't know that the users would be able to use it in the test mode. What will happen is that it was not calibration, calibrated for radiation, right? And the radiation was, the dosage was much, much higher than it was supposed to be. And uh, people, uh, again, it was a life, less or le death of life matters. So moving forward, unreliable software is not more anymore, it's going to be inconvenient. It's devastating. It's, it's going to be a disastrous result. So that's why reliability is one of the most important characteristics of a software moving forward, especially if this software are in a life or death matter devices or systems in a very highly regulated industry, as I mentioned. Any questions? I will go fast through this because I think you guys um, might already have taken, I don't know, Professor Langdon, if you guys already uh, went through the failure, the fault, the error, I think you guys might already go through do those. Um, but bottom line, go ahead. Uh, like in this way, we've talked about uh, kind of from a more like a security perspective, like CVEs and that kind of stuff. But so, yeah, like not, not explicitly. Okay. Okay, that's good. So I will I will go again over them fast. In general, failure is an observable incorrect behavior. And we'll talk about it in this small example that I have here in, in Java, as you guys can see, it's a very small example. And the fault is the incorrect, um, is the bug or the, the thing that caused the failure. A error, the error is, is two things. Sometimes, and again, I'm only using one definition here, but it could be used as two definitions. Sometimes it's definition, a definition as a generic error, which is involving a lot of things. This is not the definition I'm interested in. The definition I'm interested in, it's the cause that caused the fault. And by this, I mean that, uh, for example, it was a sloppy um, uh, sloppy kind of developer who did uh, a copy and paste or forgot a negative sign, whatever the error is. And sometimes it's not even, you will not be able to always identify the error. It's not easy. And this is not what I'm going to be focusing on. The reliability models or the reliability activities we are going to be talking about, 
is mainly about the failure and the fault. And for example, here, it's very easy example in Java. I don't know if you guys, that's a function that's supposed to be taking this a value from integer and it was supposed to be squaring this value and giving you the square value back. So what is the failure here? Or what is what will happen if you call this function with four? Anyone? It will return an eight instead of returning a 16. Anyone knows why? And I, I, it's very, very <laughs> trivial, I know. Anyone? Go ahead, guys. I see yeah. someone in the back of the room. Go ahead. Exactly, exactly. You got it. In the line, line two, so the failure is you guys would be very, very easily you could identify the failure. How? Because I'm, I was expecting the failure is a behavior that is different than what is, the, what, what is expected. So in this case, I was expecting a 16 and I got an eight. So now I know that there's a, there is a failure. What is the fault that caused the failure? As he mentioned, um, um, I saw his hand and he, he said it right. This sign supposed to be instead of this supposed to, to be to the power two instead of multiply by two, it's supposed to be to power two. Um, what is the error? I don't know. We don't know. Uh, it could be, for example, instead of uh, this was a very uh, a very fast uh, developer who typed very fast. Instead of putting shift um, um, uh, six, he put shift eight, which is, by the way, too close. And by the way, this is a very famous error just to give you guys like that. I'm not making it up. Um, uh, or it's a copy and paste. Usually when we are interested in, in errors in the industry, we look for patterns, which means that do we do a lot of copy and paste? Do we have a lot of duplic duplicate codes? Can we use these duplicate codes and make them as a module instead of making them uh, all spread over the code? So it's co coding behaviors, the ones that we are looking for when we are interested in errors. But we are mainly interested in more in faults and failures because those are easier to be observed. Any questions about those? So moving forward, this is the definitions that I'm going to use. Usually the failure is an observable behavior and fault is the bug that caused this observer behavior. By the way, it, couldn't, it could be one of the conditions. A, a fault could be one of the reasons for the failure because failure could be multiple combinations of faults that cause this failure, okay? But just, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping always. Here in this case, it was a one-to-one -one mapping. Any questions before we move forward? Last but not least, I will talk about two things and maybe take a couple of minutes break. Just for you guys, I don't know. I know it's um, um, one hour and 15 minutes. We'll try our best to finish in time, but just also to make it, as, my, as I mentioned, as more interactive as possible. In general, hardware, I don't know if you guys ever saw this before or not, hardware reliability. They have what they call the bathtub curve. It's a very famous curve that is all over industry. You would, need, you would hear about it. Um, now, moving forward, I hope when you go one day and in your interview and they ask you about hardware reliability, say it's a bathtub curve and a bathtub curve, the concept is as follows. There is three stages. During the development stage, what you do is you are building your prototypes and you are doing your demos. You are doing all those things. And at this, while you are doing the system testing and you are testing, so your failure is reducing and reducing and reducing because of your activities of testing, verification, validation. We'll talk about all those things in next slides. But bottom line is you are finding issues and you are fixing them. That's during the development phase, which they call it the burn-in phase. Later, you would release this guy and what you would have what we call the useful life. And this useful life, we would, we would depend that there is no more bugs are finding or anything. So what will happen is that your failure rate would be constant until something strange happened to the hardware. Usually hardware will wear out. So for example, I will give you guys an example. Maybe because of the heat, heat dissipations, ele electrons uh, are not as efficient as they used to be. Uh, you know, even lamps, when you put the lamp, the light bulbs, these light bulbs always usually have uh, an age because they wear out. So once things will start wearing out, what will happen is, uh, maybe due to corrosion, due to rust, due to whatever, what will happen is that during the wear out, what will happen is the failure would increase. Why? Because the products are not, or, or the, the, the hardware is not re as reliable as it used to be. So usually the failure would increase. And this is a very, as I told you, very well-known kind of, 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 um, uh, of a curve for uh, failure rates with the hardware. And, and usually hardware faults are physical faults, which means something physical happens and hardware will break because of this, okay? As for software, the, the story is a little bit different because software usually doesn't wear out and software faults are usually by design. It's usually what you enter. You are the one, you create the software. You are the one who's putting the design for it. So what happens in an ideal life, in an ideal situation, that's an ideal situation, which is not the case. What will happen is that we have also three phases. The first phase is the development phase, exactly like the hardware. You develop your software, you are testing it, you are developing it. You are finding bugs yourself, you are fixing these bugs, you are making your software more better and better, more higher reliability, which is, means less failure rates as much as you can. And once you start releasing your software, what will happen is that people would start finding bugs for you 
And by the way, this always happens, even with beta versions and things like that. People would find bugs for you and you would start fixing it and solving it. And in an ideal situation, we are assuming that when you fix it, you are not introducing anything else, which is not the case at all in software, just to give you guys a heads up. So what would happen is that the failure rate would reduce until here, which is now the useful life is done, and then you have the obsolescence. Usually hardware software does not uh, retire, as I told you, unless you have plans. Remember Windows 7, for example, what will happen is that they will have the Windows 7, they will start putting more releases in the Windows 7. And at that at one time, the, what they do, they will stop uh, doing Windows 7 anymore, but they will still service it. And one time they will say, we will not even service it. If you want to use it, use it, but it's out of service and you have to use Windows 10. That's what we call obsolescence when, when the, the software become obsolete. This is not the real life reliability thing. The real life reliability for software is as follows. Every time, every time you touch the software, there is a probability that you introduce something else. I'm a big believer in this. If anyone tells you I'm the best developer, best designer, we are, we didn't change anything. I hear it, guys, believe me. I, I work with professional in, uh, software developers for many, many, many years in industry. Every time, and I used to be in the testing team for a long time. Every time I come, oh, I only changed one piece of code. Come on, this one piece of code would introduce, it has the probability, I'm not saying 100%, but there's a high probability that it breaks something else. So it's very important to know that every time you touch the software, so this is um, uh, what will happen is this is the real life situation. Every time you touch the software, you do an upgrade that you are prone or you are um, uh, susceptible to be able to be adding more bugs, your failure would increase and so on and so forth. So this is how a, a real life software reliability would look like. What software reliability engineering is trying to do is trying to always reduce this curve, reduce the failure. Is it going to make zero bug or zero fault um, or zero failures? It's also impossible. I believe that there is no, uh, everybody believes in this. There is no free bug free software, okay? There will always be something, but the, you are doing your due diligence through software reliability engineering to make sure that you are reducing the failures as much as you can. So why software change in general? Software change because as I mentioned, change in the environment, change in the requirements, it's coming more complex and so on and so forth, okay? Time for software, you really need to take care of this. Time for software could, boot, could be two things, could be calendar time, I'm working for three hours or could be C CPU execution time. Especially when you have multiple users or millions of users, sometimes you call it the usage time, which is might be more, uh, much, much longer than a calendar time. Any questions before we move forward? I hope this is not boring, guys. I, I will say, I should add to that, the, uh, the CPU time versus calendar time, that is a very important distinction, especially when you're talking about applications at scale. You know, most of you are working on web applications and, you know, web applications, that CPU time matters a lot. Uh, you know, when you talk about a million users, if you can drop it from, you know, whatever, 100 milliseconds to 99 milliseconds, that makes a big difference as far as the, the you know, like the horsepower you need and the computers you need, et cetera. So I, I think there's a really neat, important point. So I just kind of pointed out. Um, are there any other questions? Any other questions before we move forward? Guys, come on. Even even I can stay for five hours. It doesn't matter for me. I know it's for you. It matters. But it's the most important part here. It's really grasping the, the core of these things. And that's why I'm putting these takeaways to make it as simple as possible. So take away here. Put it as a, as a, as a note in front of you as a software developer or someone who's working software engineering. Every time you touch the software, there is a probability. I'm putting probability here to be political about it. But I'm confident that you would do something but there is a probability that a bug is introduced. Software reliability engineering helps to reduce failures and increase your reliability. Time for software, again, as, as Professor Langdon was mentioning, it could be either calendar or natural time. Natural time is even more important as he mentioned. By the way, I did an interview in Amazon and you guys would know that uh, if you do an interview in Amazon. Amazon, for example, is they was very proud about that. They are one of the fastest people that could ship things for you. So once you put your order online, you do something. So here is here is an example I, I worked in on real life to just confirm what Professor Langdon was just saying. Imagine that you are doing iPhones and in the iPhones, you have end of line tests that will take one second. And instead of making it taking one second, you enhance the execution time to make it half a second. So you are producing, so one second per phone, you are producing 10 million. So you are on, on, on average, you are saving 5 million seconds by reducing this by half a second. Imagine if it's a one nanosecond reduction in your execution time or CPU time. 
with scaling, as Professor Langdon was saying, you are getting more and more horsepower by scaling things up, especially with things like AWS, like iPhones, like high mass production things. And by the way, this has really happened in with me when we're producing Raiders. Uh, our 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 things is only three millions. It's not as uh, iPhones, but still we save tons of time by just reducing the testing, the end of line test cases or the testing um, uh, testing suite by few seconds. It saved us tons. Our productivity went much much higher. Can you guys g get the the scale there? It's very important to focus when you are thinking about software. You think of both either calendar time or natural units, which is CPU time or execution time or whatever. So any questions before you move forward? I'm sorry, I just hit the, I, I hope I'm clear. Uh, you guys remind me of my students. <laughs> they are always silent. I don't know, I would assume that this is a good sign. Uh, silence is a good sign. I hope it's not the opposite. So I am assuming up to now good intentions that it's everything is clear and, and, uh, and crystal clear that you don't ask any questions anyway. Software reliability engineering. Usually there is four activities. There is more, but I always focus on four activities. We call them fault avoidance, fault tolerance, fault detection, and fault forecast. Let me go one by one. First of all, fault avoidance is that the effort that you put to be able to avoid things from happening. As I mentioned, software, most of its fault is by design. Software is a garbage in, garbage out process. So it's very important for you to do a lot of homework or due diligence diligence when you are working on your software. First of all, requirements engineering. You guys would learn a lot about this in your class. I'm, I'm sure you did. Architectural design, making sure that you have traceability. This is a big, big deal in industry. Traceability means that how requirements is being translated into code, is being translated into implementation, I mean, is being translated in test case. And when a requirement change, how your test case is going to change, there is a, they call it two-way traceability. You are tra tracing your requirements up till the end, which is the end tests or your test cases. Um, risk management, reuse. It's always good to do reuse when you have, because you know, uh, patterns, design patterns that are well known, they are usually good in solving certain issues or they are solution for certain issues and they are tested multiple times, they are well used. So this is, it's good to always do your reuse if you can. Coding guidelines. I don't know if you guys ever heard about this or not, maybe in another lecture called software FMEA. FMEA stands for failure mode and effect analysis. And the concept here is that you are, are trying to understand all your failure modes, trying to risk mitigate them, understand their probability of occurrence, uh, probability of finding them. And then based on that, you would put risk numbers for them. And based on that, you would focus your, uh, your design on, on the most risky things. Usually medical devices are risk-based devices, which means that the higher the risk, the more work you need to do in your design, in your fault avoidance and so on and so forth. Assume you didn't do a good job in fault avoidance, you really need to be able to be tolerant to your errors or the ex exception handling, recovery conditions, redundancy, re retrying mechanisms. So for example, I will give you guys a very easy example. One of the things that we used to do in automotive is whatever happens, whatever happens, you should have an exception handlings and error handlings that you always put the software in a safe state. And safe, safe state, which means that it's either um, would raise a big flag for the, the drivers to take over. Up to now, we are not yet level four autonomy or level five. We're talking about when it's both humans and uh, autonomous systems. Or you put the car in a safe state, which means that you would use the signal, try to get the car on the, on the curb on the side in a safe position. It's whatever happens. It doesn't matter. I don't care what you do. It's always you really need to handle such exceptions. Because if you don't handle them, a disaster would happen. By redundancy, I mean, if you, one of the things that we was talking about is software FMEA. Another thing that they do in industry, they call co critical component analysis. They always analyze based on the risk. What are the critical components? For example, power supplies sometimes in systems are critical components. So they will add redundancy, which means if one fail, the other would be able to take over and so on and so forth. Retrying mechanisms, you guys would, 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 uh, would see some of those examples while we are going, I hope so. Fall detection is all the things that you are learning about right now. Verification and validation, unit testing, operational profiles, we'll be talking about this tons now. Uh, longevity tests, formal reviews, load and negative testing. A lot of the time, and I'm talking, by the way, in real life experience, people that have been there for industry for years, maybe 20 years and over, sometimes they always test toward things that are working. They are making sure that their software works. It's not only that. With high risk software, you'd always make sure that your software, when it breaks, what happens? 
can I break the system? What breaks the system? What breaks the software? So it's always we do, you really need to do negative testing, load testing, stress testing, deprive, deprive it from resources, maybe cut the network from it and see what will happen. I will give you guys examples of those while we are going forward with my uh, real life industry experience. Um, uh, static code analysis, longevity testing, and so on and so forth. Last but not least is um, uh, fault forecast. And forecast is models. And this is going to be, I hope, one of your uh, take home quizzes is about one of the models is called Musa Okamoto mod model. And the concept is that it's a mathematical model that would help you to predict um, a failure rates or reliabilities and things like that, okay? Uh, Post-market surveillance analysis is data that comes from the customers like complaint data, recall data, whatever. It's very always important to do them. Any questions before we move forward? I wanted to add a little bit to this because um, we, we talked a little bit about software reliability in here. Uh, you know, kind of, uh, in, in, uh, kind of from a slightly different perspective. Um, and so I, I want to make sure all of you understand that the things that we've talked about with this goal type in the past, that this is kind of like the same thing with uh, some more formal terms around some of the roles, because we were kind of talking about it in broad strokes uh, and talking about uh, a bunch of this kind of role. And so these activities are actually not limited to just this role type, but is why this role type, this software reliability engineer, is much more common these days, because when you're talking about applications at scale, this is what the way you have to work with them uh, versus traditional ones where you can kind of point and fix things uh, when they break. When you're talking about millions of users, you know, hundreds of thousands of servers, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, this is the way you have to look at these kinds of problems. You have to look at it holistically uh, in not looking at it as kind of point solutions. So I just kind of want to point out that there's, this is a big part of how modern engineering is being done um, is to start to think about things looking at the nature kind of the, the gross environment rather than point you know looking at point specific things and these are some of the techniques you do to solve that problem does that make sense Colin? yep exactly yep yep and it's not limited to that guys i just try to put it in a in a way as as uh, professor langdon was mentioning it just trying to capture it but Every, every, every engineer nowadays, especially as, as he mentioned, is scalable devices or risk-based devices. You really need to make sure that you have all these activities in your, uh, in your um, software development. And as, as he mentioned, multiple, a lot of these things you guys might already know, but um, we are just putting them in more uh, formal definitions. <laughs> That's it. So, and you might be doing them even by default without knowing, but just, just putting them on a, in a framework always helps. Any questions before we go? We move forward, guys. I, ho I hope again this is clear, informative. Uh, we could always change the pace. If please let I sometimes talk fast, so please let me know. Uh, again, uh, the only way to really make sure that we are on the same page is through feedback. So guys, talk. Don't worry. I'm, I'm not going to be offended by anything. <laughs> so, un un unless you use cursing, this is this is not the room for it right now. <laughs> Maybe later. But if if uh, if you have any questions or anything, just let me know. <laughs> So uh, bottom line, takeaway number four. So we have three takeaways up and now. What is software? It's just, it's more than a piece of code. Number two was what is reliability? It's about the probability of failure free um, a software operation for a certain amount of time in a specified environment. Number three, we mentioned that software reliability, software bugs in general are costly. Software reliability engineering would help you to reduce your failure rate and increase your reliability. When it comes to software, you need to think about two time units natural units like CPU and execution time, especially when scalable devices and normal uh, operation hours. We talked about software reliability engineering. It is a framework that have multiple activities such as fault avoidance, fault detection, fault tolerance, fault prediction. And we give simple examples or few examples about activities in each of them. The concept is you try to design your software with a certain aspects to, be, to avoid faults. Also, if faults happens, you need to detect them. If you detect them, you could either tolerate them or you could fix them. Or at the end, you could also need to be able to be more pro proactive and predict if things is going to happen or not. So um, um, moving forward, let's take away number four. Um, any questions before we go? Uh, the only other thing I would add to this is a also a, a fast growing uh, 
industry need and other or something like I can't quite very work, but there's a lot of jobs in this space. Uh so, you know, if you're you know, if you're if you're finding the new you know, if we're finding this kind of interesting, whatever, there are definite careers here in like in this space, and uh they are generally fairly lucrative. Uh, and uh, in fact, I was just talking to somebody else at the U, and we want to actually start offering some workshops in uh, some of these processes as well, because we don't get a lot of exposure to that, even in a uh, like class like this, uh, because the scale matters, right? Like you just you need large scale before it gets interesting, um, and so that's really hard to simulate. So we've been working on trying to make that more, you know, or make it more of an option. Um, so just kind of keep it in mind, this is very, like I said, very topical. Uh, you know, you may have heard of data science being a hot thing. SRE is also a very hot thing. Yep. Totally, totally agree. And it also, if you guys are interested in continuing your master's, I don't know if you are undergrad or grad students, I would assume mix. But if you also want to continue your master's or PhD, there is a lot, a lot of, of, of research and funds in these things, especially coming from companies that do scalable the uh, software such as Google, Facebook, um, uh, Amazon, AWS is expanding like like hell in this, just to give you guys a heads up, and I will use them as an example today. I'm not using Philips, which is my company. I'm using them as an example because it's very easy to relate to, to them. So totally agree. Any questions before we move forward? I hope it's clear. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm giving simple definitions up to now. We are not talking about rocket science, simple things, I hope. Um, there is more into them, but again, it's it's not the time for for that. So it's just think of it as an introduction, as I, as I mentioned, the title is introducing you to those new concepts. And if you are in more interested, let me know or let Professor Langdon know, and we can always um, um, uh, f f like help you guys out to navigate more the the field. But in general, the software engineering process, uh, reliability engineering process, would look like that. You really need to determine. We'll talk about each step step by step. But in general, you need to know that it is a complete process. It is an iterative process. So if you are agile, or if you are continuous integration, continuous deployment or DevOps engineers, usually you integrate these activities into your iterative routine. And it is uh, the software model, which is a lot of people nowadays, especially in, in theoretical um, 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 computer science or, or even masters and PhD, a lot of them focus on the uh, reliability models because they, are, uh, they have math and they have some theoretical backgrounds behind them. It is just one piece of the puzzle. It just helps you to predict things, but it's not the whole, the whole thing. There's tons of other things that are there. So anyway, let, let's take one by one. And this is very important. And here I'm going to, going to give you guys real examples. First of all, determining your reliability objectives. What is the reliability objective means? First of all, you really need to know. And I always say this to my teams, not even to my students at Tufts, but really my teams. If you don't understand your customer requirements, you are lost. The most important link in all this is your customers. You really need to put a reliability from a point of view of customers. It's not from a point of view of, of your point of view as a developer. So you really need to understand what reliability means to your customers. That's number one point I want to point out. If customer does not know, you either guide them or you start using reliability objectives that make sense to your products. Maybe by using competitor information, using similar devices, if it's totally unique system that wasn't there before, but the bottom line is it has to be at the end always customer related. If you are developing something or testing something that was not related to a requirement, that's what I was saying, traceability is important. You are wasting your time and money because if it wasn't a requirement, you are doing something extra that you were not supposed to be doing. So it's always everything at the end have to be related to the customer requirements. Here are some um, examples, uh, and I don't know go to in details here, but a lot of you might hear those terminologies. One of the examples is to say that I will only have maybe minor bugs, uh, maybe five minor bugs during release. I would solve all maybe critical and major bugs before releasing, whatever. That's one of the reliability objectives. You could say I could operate continuously for X amount of a number of system hours without failure. By the way, you really need to prove this. That's why reliability objective is important. And that's why all the techniques we're talking about is important. So once you determine a target, you really need to live up to it. I will show you guys right now. But the concept is, OK, I want to prove that my system would work for, let's say, a million hours. And this is where Mr. Professor Langdon was talking about when we are talking about accelerated tests, which means that I would simulate that as if my system worked for a million hours in, in maybe a week or one day, because I'm accelerating my tests. This is called highly accelerated tests. It's always trying to prove to your 
objective reliability. There's something called also mean time between failures. So if you have a failure that happens, so this is mean time between failure means between one failure and another, how long you would take. There's something called mean time to repair, how long it will take you to repair the system and so on and so forth. Um, um, you guys can see that total number of software failures is X, number of system hours is no more than Y. So I would have certain amount of failures. By the way, this definition is what Amazon is using. Okay, so reliability objective is number one. And my questions for you, which will be part of your take home quiz, if you guys are now working on a project, do you have any reliability objectives? I don't know if you have a graduation project or a class project or not. <laughs> I don't know how the system is. Or if you're even working in any project outside of the class, do you have any reliability objectives? Do you really need to understand how long your system should work for without failures? Let's continue. Here is a very famous example that everybody uses nowadays, which is availability, especially for AWS. That's a real life example. And the, the, the reference is there, that's from AWS. They have what they call the four nines, the three nines, the five nines. I don't know if you guys heard about this before or not, but it's as simple as that. Four nines means that my system would work 99.99% of the time. So it's available 99.99% of the time. You guys all, all, I hope you all know AWS. It stands for Amazon Web Services. And the concept is that they have cloud storage that you could save servers, that you could serve, save your data on them. And you could retrieve your data. That's what they claim. Anytime with the most high reliable availability issue that you can, uh, availability that you could find on the market. That's again what their marketing is. So they claim is, and this is by the way from their website, it's totally copy and paste. They say single region scenarios, they have reliabilities of 99 only, which is two nines, three nines, four nines. For multi-region scenarios, they have three and a half nines, which is 99.95% availability of the time. And the recovery time is between five to 30 minutes. So if an error happens, you could only expect your system would be down only for three, 30 minutes or five minutes or whatever it is, okay? And then they have uh, others. And by the way, each one of those you pay differently. <laughs> so the more reliable your software is, the higher you pay, do you guys agree? <laughs> so now it's even a kind of a market strategy to use. So let's say if you are a, you ha, you are a, a subscriber that you don't have important information, I don't care if the system is, uh, is out for 30 minutes, it doesn't matter for me. So I will pay the less amount when I'm using the 999. So they usually put you in a role priority to recover or whatever it is. What does 49 means? From a calendar point of view, from a calendar point of view, it is, it means that your system needs to be down 52 minutes per year. So for the whole year, you can only be down for 52 minutes or less. How did they do this calculation? Or how do they do this calculation? Using the 360 days per, per year, 365 days per year, 60 minutes per hour, 24 hours per day, you get this number. To get 99% of this percentage is 552 minutes, that's it. So your system has to be available the whole year, but 52 minutes. Now you are 99%, 99.99% availability. So for Amazon, for Amazon, if you guys go look for their web, on their web page, they say that assume that we have 15 minutes to recover from a failure, assuming two failures, they, they have to prove that they only have two failures per whole year. Only two failures, not only that. Each failure should take no more than 15 minutes. So imagine all these AWS servers that are running all the time, how many backups they have, how many um, um, maybe algorithms and check things that they are doing every time there is pinging, there is making sure to monitor their systems, to make sure that their system is available. The whole year, they only allow two failures, each of them is less than 15 minutes. This is the 4999s, the 49s that they are talking about, the 99.99%. And this is, by the way, they, they, they claim it in their contracts, so they have to live up to it because this is a legal binding kind of agreement with their customers. If you claim something, you have to prove it. You have to live up to it. So imagine how many testing or how much testing efforts and things they are putting to prove this kind of thing. Do you guys imagine, especially with scalability that Professor Langdon was talking about? Any questions about this? Also, so this is, go ahead. Also why, you know, like things like continuous delivery, uh, continuous integration, uh, you know, those become a lot more real, right? Like, imagine the software you've worked on, it can literally only be down for 52 minutes the entire year, right? Think, think about how hard that is, right? Like, think about how hard it is to have your app that you're running on your laptop 
be up for that, like that continuous thing, right? And it's just, you know, failure rates of 52 minutes a year are very, very small. And one of the things people don't often realize is how expensive two nines versus three nines versus yep. four versus five <laughs> Yeah, you are totally right. Each one of those nines is not just a normal nine that you guys know, just to give you guys a heads up, because it's, it's, it's again, as, as, as Professor Langley mentioned, it is more and more difficult. And guys, also remember, the, the, this is also including serviceability, which means that sometimes you need to upgrade their software, as he mentioned, continuous integration to your deployment, you are upgrading your software all the time. So if you have something that break your system, you really need to make sure that it doesn't go to the customers or your deployment servers. It, it is it is very expensive just to be to be open. And it exactly what you mentioned, Professor Landon, is 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 confirming all all these numbers that we are talking about. Any questions, guys? Before we move forward, does this make sense? Oh, there is a question. That's good. Thank you for asking the question. <laughs> There's a question in the back. I, I didn't get it, unfortunately. So, okay, if you can repeat it, uh, Professor Landon, that would be great. Yeah, I also typed it. Uh, so oh, in the I, I, I cannot cheat the chat because I'm putting in the Zoom the whole thing. I don't want to, to change the setup. I'm sorry. Um, so, the question was basically it's like, okay, so you're claiming four nines. How does Amazon or whoever prove the, that they have uh, four nines of time? Great question. So I will tell you, I don't know how Amazon proving it. I will tell you how we, we used to prove things on our side, for example. First of all, as Professor Langdon was mentioning, we have what we call continuous integration, continuous deployment pipes, pipeline, which is as follows. Every night after you do changes, and so what happens is in the morning, I'm a software developer. I will come, check out my code, start developing some piece of code, doing something. Then at the end of the day, I will check it in. Before check it in, there is multiple, multiple, steps that you should go through, unit testing, static code analysis, coding guidelines um, are being followed or not. There's tons of, of quality aspects that you need to go on. Once the code is in, what will happen is that this system would nightly, on nightly basis, there's servers like Jenkins. I don't know if you guys heard about this or not, which is a, which is a release build kind of, of server. It will come and do the nightly builds, deploy it on the system, run it for very long time. Sometimes we have accelerated tests. So we run these things with acceleration, which means that instead of maybe one hour in real life, it is thousand hours in, in CPU kind of execution time, either running things parallel or, 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 or simulating users that are more than, than what's supposed to be the system doing and so on and so on. And every night we are building these things. On the side, we used to have what we call testing servers. Those ones are running for all, all time. They never stop. And on, on, on whatever releases that we are going to do. So what happens is that these things, we call them longevity tests and things that are reliability tests that we are running these things on our environments for a very long time. And I will tell you, the next slide would even confirm what I was saying. We always make our environment as close as possible to the environments of our customers. So that's also proving the things. Does this guarantee, uh, in our case, I don't know how AWS, unfortunately, I never worked with them. I wish one day but I don't know how they are doing it, but uh, it, I'm 100% sure it's similar, similar concepts. Does this guarantee that this will be in real life? It's not. Another thing that AWS would do because they have a lot of money is that beside these kinds of things, they would have redundant systems. So they would repeat, especially for the one with the 999s. So in real life, they might have more than two failures, but you would not feel them as a customer. So that's another also um, door, back doors for, for not always working all the time like this. Does this answer the question? I hope so. Yep. Okay. And again, Professor Len, please, please feel free to chime in if I if I missed something or 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 something is happening there or or there's an information that could be always added there. I will. Any... Uh, Go ahead. We actually only have about five minutes left. Oh wow. So I I will move a little bit faster. I'm I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I didn't realize that. Um. Anyway, so. The second part you guys need to know is operational profiles, which means that you really need to understand how your customers are using your, your system as much as I can, the environment I was talking about. And, um, um, uh, and, and, and you really need to, uh, let's take an example, you need to understand what is the highest operational profile your customers are using your stuff in. So you really need to understand what, how your customers are using these systems and be able to put your time 
um, more time in testing toward what customers is using your things to be able to do it. One of the very famous examples we saw in medical devices, medical records are being um, um, uh, handled by systems. Those systems, we always have different profiles like admin IT profiles, normal users like physicians and nurses. We thought that normal users would be the highest uh, operational profile that people, people will be using. Unfortunately, we find that the hospital gave everybody admin access. And we didn't do the same testing for admin as we did for the other operational profile. So what will happen is that there is a lot of things that would, would show. So it's always important for you to understand how your customers are, are using your software. Um, uh, and again, the goal is to determine the highest uh, operational profile that is being used to be able to increase your reliability. Unfortunately, due to time, software testing, you guys know about all this. I hope you, you study it as um, um, uh, in, your, um, in, in a lot of things. Uh, in general, I'm not going through this. One of the important, so you, you really need to inc include different types of, of testing. That's the, the takeaway here, which means that unit testing, integration testing, verification, validation, reviews, static code analysis, do, um, uh, do a lot of activities when it comes to verification, validation, and testing. This is very important. To be able to predict the future, you really need to collect data in present and past data. This is exactly like any data analysis course you take. In software, you really need to collect data as much as you can. So you really need to identify KPIs, key performance indicators, such as number of defects, number of failures, whatever you really need. And I'm asking you guys, in your current project that you're working on, do you have any KPIs? Do you have complex, psychometric complexities for your module? Do, are, are your module complex or not? How psychometric complexity is related to numbers of bugs per module, uh, numbers of lines of course, so on and so forth. There's a lot of KPIs that you should collect to be able to feed your models to be able to predict the future. So to be able to predict the future, just like any data analysis, you really need to know the past and the present data to be able to predict how your future would look like. So make sure that, take away number five, identify your reliability goals, understand your operational profile, how your customers are going to be using your, pro, your, your software, test your software considering those operational profile, put your effort in the most used operational profile, collect data, KPIs such as, defect numbers, defect density, failure intensity, and so on and so forth. Any questions? I don't want to go, unfortunately, because of time limitation, I don't know even how maybe Professor Landon, we can talk it off, talk offline about the quiz, but the take home, uh, whatever, it's not quiz, it's like an open book kind of thing. But bottom line is there is something called sort of so software reliability growth models. And these models are mathematical models that have some assumptions and factors into them. Um, they are used to predict and estimate the, um, uh, as I mentioned, let's go back a little bit, one, one slide here. So you have, this is your real life data. You can predict when you can meet your reliability target using these models, how many testing you need, how many releases you need, and so on and so forth. Also, you could use, you could train these models to be uh, just like any other models to be good to estimate your current situation. Okay. One of the, there is multiple types of these models, which is time between failure models. Uh, failure count models, they count the failures. And this, this is the one that we're going to be studying today. Failure seeding models, which they put, see, they put er errors or put faults that they know to be able to catch errors that or faults that they don't know about. And there is another one called input domain. Anyway, um, uh, so when it comes to software reliability models, takeaway here is that software reliability growth models are no one size fits all. It's very important for you to understand your project, select the appropriate model, understand assumptions and factors of the model and mathematical model. Make sure to validate your model. That's a very important thing. Make sure it's really fitting your needs and then use it to estimate and predict your reliability. Do not put your life on a stake for a model. That's always my advice. It is just a helper. It's an enabler. Do not depend on a model 100%. That's a, an, an issue a lot of people do. I don't like it, by the way. Anyway, one of the models is called Musa basic model. I would go very fast about it, unfortunately. This is the, the concept that I was trying to do in the take home ex the take home quiz or whatever, take home homework or whatever you call it. Uh, the concept is this guy is, is, is a linear, it, it says it's a linear model assumption. It makes uh, linear uh, and it has simple assumption that all, med all faults are equally to occur, so equal probability. They are independent of each other, which by the way, it's not always true. Execution time between failures is large compared to instruction execution time. Whenever a fault is fixed, it never happens again. So, and not only that, when you fix a fault, you are not, or a failure, you are not introducing any other failures. So this is the assumption that such model would, would assume. It's not true most of the time because sometimes faults or failures are, are correlated to each other. Sometimes when you fix a failure, you would add something else. Anyway, using this model, you would have what we call failure intensity dependent on 
the average total number of failures and um, uh, the 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 number of failures you would expect at the end of the project, like um, when you run this thing eventually for a very long time. Using these kinds of model, you could also predict the rate of decrease of failure intensity per failure. You could predict the mean failures experienced, which is mu in is expressed in terms of execution time, failure intensity versus execution time for basic. This is one of the things that we will do in the in the in take home um, homework. And then some other additional, which is what is the additional required time to um, have um, um, more failure intensity or the additional required um, uh, errors um, uh, or failures to have um, additional, to, to reach an additional uh, failure intensity. 